their lives and work back into the workforce so they can support themselves, their children, and their families. So I'm going to I'm going to start the rest of this off with a prayer. For those of you who may know the words and want to join in, please do so. For everyone else, I ask that you take a moment and reflect upon your existence here. Thank you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, for earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us for our trespasses and those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. So, today is going to be an interesting day. I want to say again, welcome to all the members of the cameraman. Welcome to Baltimore. We're so pleased to have you. Myself and the members of the committee here in Baltimore, thank you for your courage, for your bravery, for your consistency. And we also acknowledge the loss that you suffered that has brought you to this point. So let me first of all thank the members of the Baltimore Organizing Committee that did an outstanding job to assist in bringing you all here. That's Cassie McKeel, Clayton Todd, and Mr. Neil Franklin from Leap. And I want to especially thank Neil. He took the effort to meet up with the caravan at the border of San Diego and traveled with him for some time. Jumped off the caravan in Atlanta to come back here to help us prepare. So thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, with that out of the way, I want to take a moment the rest of the sponsoring organizations here in Baltimore that helped to organize the two-day events to make sure that the members of the caravan were comfortable. Those organizations are the NAACP, Baltimore Chapter, Leaders of the Beautiful Struggle, we want to thank you for the events on yesterday, Ray Emmons, Open Society Foundation, again, Luke, which is a law enforcement against prohibition organization, my organization, including Slate America, the United Workers, Critical Resistance, Global Exchange, Casa de Maryland, Movement for Peace, and especially the Herald County Friends of Latin America, who were kind enough and gracious enough to supply the refreshments for today. So, with all that being said, let's formally get this show underway. We have a lot to cover, lots of interesting information. Thank you again. That all said, I'm going to introduce our final speaker, the Honorable Kirk Smoke, former mayor of Maryland, of Baltimore. <laughs> Mr. Smoke is now the dean of the Howard University Law School. As some of you may know, and others you may not be familiar, he was a pioneer of his day here in Baltimore. He led the city through positive diversity, motivated citizens, organized action, stirred up the landscape and the city council. But most importantly, for the reason for in regards to this event, he went out on a limb and indicated to the nation that the war on drugs as it exists and existed at that time was an excuse. And that we should look at it more in terms of a health initiative, not so much as a criminal justice issue. So with that said, I'm going to bring up the Honorable Kurt Smoke. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Buenos Aires. I am uh, very sorry that I cannot deliver this uh, speech in both Spanish and English, 
but I am so pleased that we have friends that will be supportive and help me out in this regard. I want to not only thank uh, Caravan for Peace for bringing this initiative here to uh, Baltimore, but thank you for your efforts to lift up the issues of the war on drugs, why it's a failure, what it has done in our communities, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. It is very important work that you do, and it is work that unfortunately will have to continue for several years to come. In 1914, a law was passed in the United States called the Harrison Act. That began what we currently call the War on Drugs. In 2014, unfortunately, we will be celebrating the 100th year of the War on Drugs. It is my hope that at least in that year, we can have peace and not continue war. Let me uh, acknowledge, uh, before I give my very brief uh, remarks, the fact that we do have two local elected officials here in the audience. And I want to acknowledge a member of our state legislature, State Delegate Dan Morheim, who is also a physician. I want to acknowledge the state's attorney for Baltimore City has been a very progressive prosecutor, Mr. Greg Bernstein. I mentioned to you that the war on drugs in the United States started in 1914. I want to highlight for you, though, a comment by a man who was a police chief and the president of the International Association of Chiefs of Police back in 1936. His name was August Fulmer. He was an outstanding progressive law enforcement official. And he said at that time, and I quote him, drug addiction is not a police problem. It never has been and never can be solved by policing. It is first and last a medical problem. That was in 1936, and yet we are still continuing to fight the battle today of trying to get our country and our policymakers to understand that the war on drugs is complicated. It is not a single silver bullet that was solved, but most importantly, it is a health problem and not a crime problem. You bring to our attention, and I know that our, our hero, uh, Senor Cecilia, has understood this, that there is, it is an international problem, and not only international, but interconnected. That is, what happens in this war in one country affects what happens in uh, this uh, war on drugs in another country. We are seeing the terrible, terrible impact of the war on drugs in Mexico recently. Not only in the large number of deaths, the rise in the cartels, but unfortunately in watching American policy, particularly the so-called fast and furious policy of selling uh, weapons uh, in a land, trying to track those weapons, a very bad policy that has done more harm than good. We have seen what's happened in Colombia with the United States policy, so-called Plan Colombia, that was supposed to help that country, but in fact all that it did was to buy large numbers of helicopters that could be used by the military, not only to attack civilians, but to spray poisonous um, material in the areas of uh, civilian populations. And then just yesterday, I pick up the New York Times and I cut this article out that says the United States suspends its anti-drug radar sharing with Honduras. What had happened is that as a part of the war on drugs, the United States sold technical information and intelligence, uh, so-called 
spying operations to the government of Honduras was supposed to be used to help fight the war on drugs, but the Honduran government ended up using it to shoot down civilian aircraft of people who were deemed uh, suspicious by uh, the, the government. Now, I want to point out there have been very positive things with respect to international involvement and our interconnectedness. Caravan for Peace in coming here and explaining to communities in the United States how we share uh, the, the agony of the war on drugs is very important. Here in Baltimore, many years ago, we tried to make an improvement in fighting one aspect of the drug problem, which is the AIDS problem, the spread of AIDS. And we wanted to do that by having a needle, a sterile syringe exchange program. We were not very successful in getting the public to understand it until friends from overseas, from the Netherlands, came over and explained it was law enforcement officials, it was public health officials from the Netherlands that came over and explained how the needle exchange could help reduce the spread of AIDS without increasing the criminal aspects of the war on drugs. So that was a very positive aspect of the international aspect of and the interconnectedness of uh, the, the, drug, uh, the drug problem. But I have been disappointed. Not only as the mayor, I was the mayor of this city for 12 years, and I was so proud of our community for being creative in, in trying to make sure we, we did more to treat those who had been drug addicted and allowing us to do the needle exchange program which helped so many AIDS uh, uh, victims. I'm very proud, I'm very proud of the Baltimoreans in their efforts to be uh, creative. But I've been so disappointed at the national leaders, not just the Republicans, it's been the Democrats also. The, I thought that the Republicans would just look at the money that's being wasted on the war on drugs. They care so much about balancing the budget and doing efficient things with money. The war on drugs nationally is an absolute waste of dollars. And it, it should be uh, converted from heavy on law enforcement to more on public health. But they didn't do it. And then when the Democrats came in, I thought, well, maybe there would be a change there. But as I said, we had this fast and furious uh, policy. And then, unfortunately, our, our president decided to attack medical marijuana in, in California um, for reasons that I simply don't understand. Well, let me pause. I do understand. Because this is a very political issue. And when you look at the war on drugs going over uh, for the last almost 100 years, you have to ask yourself, don't people understand the definition of insanity? That is, most people understand that if you do the same thing over and over and expect a different result, that is one definition of insanity. But the war on drugs, we continue to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. Why? Why is that? Because the war on drugs is mostly about money and power. This is not about people just being addicted to drugs. It is also about people being addicted to drug money. And you say, well, who's addicted to drug money? Well, look who benefits by the current uh, policy that we have. People make big money on prohibition. Prohibition failed in the 1920s to make ours an alcohol-free America, and prohibition is failing today to make ours a drug-free America. But many people, many people are making a lot of money. Drug cartels, of course. But financial institutions, many financial institutions, private corrections, people who make money building jails are very happy with the war on drugs as we uh, have it uh, today. And, and many, many who receive money for military misadventures also are uh, happy with the current. So it's money and power, and we have to break the grip of that.
And it is my hope that efforts like Caravan for Peace will do that. And in the United States, our key to starting a, a, new, a new method, a new approach, is by starting to accept the definition of our problem as it was laid out by a great uh, American uh, professor. His name was David Musto, and he wrote a book that described the drug problem as, quote, the American disease. Think about it. Think about it. The problem that he's saying is that this is all of, this is a, primarily a health problem. Addiction and AIDS, which are related to the, the war on drugs, these things are health problems. And ladies and gentlemen, you don't arrest your way out of a disease. You don't prosecute your way out of a disease. And you don't incarcerate your way out of a disease. You have to come out of the strategy. Let us start by redefining this as a health problem, primarily a health problem and not a crime problem. We know that the criminal justice system has a role to play. It's just not the primary role. It is the public health that should lead the way. So I'm asking you as we welcome our friends for Caravans for Peace and all the friends who are considering uh, doing something different about the war on drugs, Let's think globally, but act globally. Think globally, but act globally. We know that this problem is an international problem. Our elected officials at the highest level are not about to do something about it, so we have to do something at the local level. And what is that? Well, we in the city, in the state, in the private sector, and our individual citizens have to carve out the ways in which we can work together. We can expand treatment for those who have been addicted. We can expand rehabilitation. We can also make sure that we are doing what some of these organizations are doing, which is to try to make sure that when people get arrested and serve their time, that if they've done well, that they get to wipe that off their record. That they expunge that and get a fresh start. Because there's so many young people that get involved early and yet want to go on and live wonderful and productive lives. You know, when George Bush, the president, was asked whether he ever did drugs as a young person, what he said was, when I was young and irresponsible, I was young and irresponsible. So he never admitted what we know he did in his, as a young man. But he was able to get a fresh start. He was able to change her, the, the community, society supported him in the fresh start. And I think that that's what we owe our young people. And finally, because of my concern about involvement in citizenship, we ought to do all that we can to eliminate the laws that prevent people who have a criminal conviction from being able to vote. Yeah. Right now, there are so many uh, laws that restrict the ability of people uh, to vote, and it makes such a huge difference. In 2008, in the presidential election in, in uh, 2008 in, in the United States, 13%, 13% of African American men who by age were eligible to vote in that election were prevented from voting because of something that happened when they were very uh, young. 13%, just think about that, how the difference that that could make uh, in an election. Well, there's much more that we can say, and I know you will hear from the panel and hear from those who have been victimized, but I just come to say that we all should be hopeful that we can make change, that it may be slow, and we know that uh, progress is sometimes very difficult. But I do believe that in 2014, we will no longer be using the term war as it relates to drugs, but by 2014, we will indeed be talking about peace. Thank you very much.
the Honorable Mayor Kurt Mo for being here with us today and bearing the heat and, and, and the late start. I used to, he was a real trooper. But what I want to do before he leaves, I want to formally make Mayor Kurt Mo a formal member, an honorary member of the Caravan for Peace. We've been doing with our, our members of the caravan of peace have been thinning them.
y el rostro de esa locura, de esa estupidez y al hablar de mí hablo de tantas víctimas de mi país el amor de mi hijo y de sus amigos cuando uno vive la muerte de un hijo en estas condiciones cuando se tira la muerte de sus amigos en estas condiciones porque sus muchachos yo los vi crecer yo los llevaba a jugar fútbol yo me sentaba con ellos a la mesa y conversábamos yo vi sus sueños cuando uno se enfrenta a esto uno sabe lo que significa Auschwitz porque Auschwitz no es un asunto de cantidad, es un asunto de intensidad, de locura y de dolor inmenso. Y a veces de esa muerte no respondí y las víctimas de mi país han correspondido con la misma fuerza desmesurada en sentido positivo de lo que fue el crimen, de lo que fue la muerte y la desmesura de mí por nuestros hijos. Yo me pregunto muchas veces si esta guerra y la táctica de Felipe Calderón y de los Estados Unidos no fuera mi hijo estaría vivo, un inocente. Porque mi hijo, Juan Francisco Juanelo, y sus amigos eran inocentes, no eran adictos nunca había probado la droga no fumaba tomaba una cerveza de cuando en cuando eran buenos deportistas mi hijo le pagó la mitad de su carrera con la beca deportiva estaban empezando a trabajar mi hijo se estaba a punto de recibirse otro de los muchachos también mi hijo como administrador de empresas otro muchacho como arquitecto, el otro era diseñador, ya recibido, ya trabajaba, eran muchachos buenos. Y me pregunto si esta guerra que se desata para evitar que adictos que eligieron libremente drogarse, y para salvaguardar un Estado que no ha sabido construir una política de salud pública y de vida humana me pregunto por qué tendrían que morir los muchachos pero la guerra es estúpida en todos los sentidos proteger adictos y servir a los beneficios de los capitales más innobles que son los de la violencia del crimen ya sea legal o ilegal cuando Felipe Calderón auspiciado por la política antidroga de los Estados Unidos y de la guerra contra las drogas, decide hacer una guerra, sacar al ejército a las calles, obligó a los cárteles que estaban buscando simplemente su nicho en el mercado a armarse de la misma forma que el ejército. Y ese ejército de los cárteles está formado por delincuentes por gente terrible, gente malvada. Y después decide hacer una política de descabezar a los capos de los cárteles. Y lo que produjo fue la multiplicación de células criminales sin control alguno. La muerte de mi hijo se debe, de sus amigos se debe a eso, a células criminales que nadie controlaba ya y que su objetivo ya no era la droga, sino el crimen, la extorsión, la trata de personas, el sumecimiento de cualquiera por cualquier cantidad de dinero. Eso es lo que ha generado esta guerra, diversificación del crimen, multiplicación del horror, muerte de inocentes, y ese es el dolor que traemos, es el dolor que trae 
es el dolor que no se me va a quitar nunca y es la respuesta que he dado a la imbecilidad de los criminales y de un Estado corrompido y estúpido como el mexicano y de un Estado corrompido en otro nivel.